Hi, my name is Paul Mason, and I'd like to speak a bit about astrobiology. And astrobiology is the study of life, but not just life anywhere, life in the universe beyond Earth. So, in fact, uh, that's kind of strange because we only know of life anywhere in the universe. The only place we know of it is here on Earth. So astrobiology is the study of the potential or the possibility for life outside and beyond what we know of it here on Earth. And so if we look at um, the inner solar system and we have this picture here where the red is a region too close to the sun and the blue is a region too far from the sun to have enough light to provide a uh, habitable zone. And we see that the Earth and Mars are um, in the habitable zone. Venus is on the near edge, just uh, uh, not habitable, in the not habitable region in the inner part of the solar system. So uh, what do I mean by habitable zone then? A habitable zone is the region surrounding a star for which it's possible to have water on, it, on the surface. So out beyond in the blue part, well out in the solar system, water exists in the form of ice on moons and planets uh, and uh, uh, other objects in the solar system. Asteroids, comets, you can have ice throughout the solar system. Closer in, the, uh, closer in, we don't have as much ice. In fact, on these objects here, we only have ice at the poles for the most part, and Venus is too hot. Mercury has ice on the, the bottom of craters, and Mars has polar ice caps and uh, ice under the surface. So we, this is what we mean by the habitable zone, though, and, and this is useful to think about in terms of other stars. So the Sun is a G-type star and has a habitable zone as described. And this is sort of to scale uh, the uh, habitable zone of different stars. Uh, and here's an M star, and the habitable zone would be closer. And the problem is that being closer to the M star, M stars also very volatile. They have they have uh, flares, they have very high winds uh, that last for a long time, and a lot of magnetic activity. And so these are problematic in terms of being around. Now these stars do last a long time, which is good for habitabilities, but the, the planet must be very close, and it's dangerous to be really close to these types of stars. So the Sun, the G-type stars, we think that single stars throughout our galaxy that uh, have planets in the habitable zone are very potentially habitable planets. Now, if we go to the higher mass stars, like for instance, A stars, they have an advantage in the habitable zone as being far from the star and very wide out here. However, these stars have very short lifetimes. They run through their life cycles and um, uh, explode as a supernova or uh, at least uh, have a planetary nebula um, and run through their cycles and become giants in a time too short for life, especially life as we know it here on Earth. So those stars might last only millions or hundreds of millions of years depending upon exactly uh, where uh, on the main sequence those stars are. So this tells us that for the most part sun-like stars are our best candidates for habitable planets. Now what about discoveries? What has been found? Well recently the TRAPPIST-1 system has been found and these are all um, sort of Earth-like or super-Earth sized and mass planets and several of them are in the habitable zone the thing is, though, this is a very low-mass star, M-star, that um, may 
be uh, it's certainly a very different kind of of habitable zone and a, a, a different kind of situation that we have here. So this has been enlarged 25 times. All of this would fit inside this here with this habitable zone very close to that star. So if this star is, if it's, if you, these planets are able to survive their habitability near that star, then this would be um, okay because there are several planets there. And this is a fairly nearby system. We could look at another Kepler 90 shown here, and just that there's a lot of. Uh, so over here we have the orbits of the Kepler 90 system, up, and here we have Venus and Mercury, Venus, and Earth in the inner solar system, and there's quite a few planets here in a very compact space. So it's possible to have multiple planets that are habitable in such a kind of a system. And we can see just uh, how these are fairly large planets that we're talking about in the Kepler-90 system. Um, so we would have to allow for the fact that uh, uh, possibility for life on these a little bit larger than Earth planets, super Earth planets. What about binary? Some Binaries have enhanced habitability over single stars, and um, uh, this show depicts a binary, so two stars are very close to each together, orbiting around. Any planets orbiting outside the dotted line are on stable orbits. Here is an example planet orbiting out here. The green part is the habitable zone, so the planet is orbiting safely out there, and an advantage of some binaries in this case is that the two stars are at such a distance with an orbital period maybe about 20 or 30 days and they tidally torque each other they're, they're tidal forces causing the rotation of the star to um, come into synchronous rotation so tidal forces just like the the same ones with the earth and the moon except here we're talking about the tidal forces between two stars in a binary. What the tidal forces do is they cause the stars to slow their rotation um, over a period of time that is short compared to how long a single stars take to slow their rotation. And a fast, rota fast rotating star is one that is not, uh, does not prov provide a, a, uh, a nice environment in the habitable zone. It has a habitable zone, but it would provide a, a violent environment with solar flares and this sort of thing. So a star's rotation rate decreases over time, the habitable zones become more habitable. And in some binaries, this is done naturally by a process of tidal synchronization of the binary. And so one thing we know is that about half of all half of all stars are formed in a binary, and about half of them are formed single stars. And so, who knows, maybe somewhere there is a uh, scientist that is coming to a conclusion on this planet, which is obviously orbiting a pair of stars in a binary system, and maybe they would conclude it's highly unlikely that life exists around single stars. And so when we say, hey, maybe it's unlikely that life exists around binary stars, well, we could consider the, the uh, alternative case here. And um, results, this, this uh, was proposed by uh, myself, Mason, Zuluaga, Quartas, and Clark in 2013. And the reference is given there. Now, what about other things? What about, is there a galactic habitable zone? And we can think of this not as a strict habitable zone, but as the probability of having planets that are habitable is not good near the center of the galaxy. There are lots and lots of stars and probably lots and lots of planets. So. We have to balance that with, with lots and lots of possible planets. However, 
There, this is a, a place where lots of uh, flaring events occur, lots of gamma ray bursts, supernovae, um, and um, uh, lots of radiation, cosmic rays, environment, and such as is, uh, makes it more hazardous in this region. Outside at the edge of the galaxy, where these are where stars are just beginning to form and the elements are beginning to build up. You need to have the elements uh, like oxygen and nitrogen, carbon and iron and silicon in order to build planets, especially habitable ones. And so there's not so many of those metals out here. Those are called, we could call those metals, any kind of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. So in this region, it's more uh, likely that planets could be habitable. It doesn't mean it's, it is habitable or it isn't, uh, and, that, and that we couldn't have habitable ones outside or in there, but it's probably more likely in that annulus. Well, to depict that, we could look at that in detail. This is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and um, what this shows is the, the metals, the, the, the materials that are needed to make planets and make habitable planets. If I'm far out in the galaxy, this is thousands of parsecs, kiloparsecs, beyond about 10 here or up above in the halo and above the thin disk even, there's not enough heavy elements to provide uh, um, very many planets at least. It, that's, it's a numbers game. We don't have as many planets with enough heavy elements out there. And we mentioned that, that in the inner part of the galaxy, it's very violent, even though there's lots of heavy elements, you have to be able to avoid um, threats and, and catastrophic events here. So the sun is located out about eight kiloparsecs or so, and this box here is what uh, we represent and with work with Peter Bierman and, my, and myself, the region of the galactic habitable zone where there is enough metals, enough materials, and they also uh, are located far enough away from the threats in our galaxy. Well, what about in the rest of the universe? Well, not all galaxies are as habitable as the Milky Way. Here is one that probably is, maybe even in some sense more habitable. This is a local group galaxy, M33. It doesn't have, apparently has no or black hole in the center, no supermassive black hole in the center. It has uh, moderate star formation go going on. It has a good spiral structure. And, uh, and so in the spiral arms, the, uh, all the things are there for low numbers of threats and good place for planets. Here's M82, also not a far away galaxy. This is a star forming galaxy. It's nearby um, uh, another galaxy and it's gone through a near miss collision with M81 and lots of star formation has taken place. This is a not a suitable galaxy for habitability because of all that star formation causing lots of threats and supernovas, gamma ray bursts. Here is a galaxy, Centaurus A, with a supermassive black hole in the center producing enormous jets. So this also is one that we think um, is at least a uh, non-ideal circumstance for having habitable planets in intense radiation environments. And so that is a brief summary of astrobiology.